guys, welcome to my first review for 2021. It's my official first proper video of the year. I'm a couple weeks late with this as usual, so not much has changed. The only thing really that has changed is uh, my background and my intro and yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> so, so really nothing. Um, yeah, I watched this I don't know how many weeks ago now, one, two weeks ago, and as usual it takes me ages to think over what I'm gonna say, and then it takes me even longer to get motivated to get in front of the camera to say all of it. Plus I was also working on a companion video to this one, whereas, uh, so this one is completely focused on my review of Promising Young Woman, which as you can see from the title is full of spoilers, and uh, a video coming up after this one is actually going to be me diving into the rape revenge genre, so if you're interested in checking that out, um, please do. Uh, this video may be a bit triggering as I am going to be a bit open and personal with it, so I will alert you when that moment becomes triggering and tell you when you can skip it, so hopefully uh, we can avoid anyone feeling too uncomfortable. But anyway, time to dig into my thoughts on Promising Young Woman. Promising Young Woman is a 2020 American thriller directed and written by Emerald Fennell in her feature directorial debut. The film follows a young woman traumatized by a tragic event in her past who seeks out vengeance against those who cross her path. I'm going to start this off by saying that this film exposes a deep-rooted issue that audiences have accepted for far too long. Now many of us are aware of this fact, but if you're not, then this film is very eye-opening. For a long time, rape revenge films have depicted gratuitous violence more so towards their female victims and attempted to pass this off as empowerment when it is anything but. They'll spend plenty of time showing you the violent assault of the woman and will often do so in great detail, but the revenge often takes a fraction of the time and depending on the film is often nowhere near as violent as the original assault. And as this is all happening, studios are declaring it's women taking back their power and I have to disagree with this. Promising Young Woman, on the other hand, is a completely different story. For starters, this film has no blood, no gore, no depiction of gratuitous violence whatsoever. It has no depiction of rape and I think maybe only even says the word once or twice at most. I can't remember it being said, but I think it was at some point. This film does not spoon feed you a story or narrative and is completely performance driven, specifically that of Carrie Mulligan and boy was it stellar. From simply watching how she reacts to people and places and situations and things being said, it tells you everything you need to know about the story. But if you're struggling to figure out some things as we move forward, those are addressed more directly. Kerry Mulligan is truly outstanding in this film. I was in complete awe of what she brought to her character and the film and how she sold it to me. I haven't seen a performance like it in the last year. You could see this woman holds so much grief and anger and guilt and she's so lost because of it. She's so focused on this one event in her life and she can't move past it that it has ruined her life. Everyone has moved on but her and that makes her feel worse. Honestly, all the performances in this film were brilliant. Laverne Cox is this hilarious and encouraging friend. Bo Burnham, a charming and endearing young man who seems so trustworthy you couldn't find a better guy. Jennifer Coolidge, I've never seen give a performance of this nature before and I was surprised and impressed since I'm so used to seeing her in a comedic setting and this was such an understated performance for her. Great work. Clancy Brown trying to be light-hearted but also the mediator of the family. Just a brilliant cast in general. This film is 100% psychological. It shows you can exact revenge without having to resort to violence. Cassie spends her weekends depicting herself as a vulnerable young woman and waits for someone to take the bait. You'd think she tortures, kills, or even hands them over to the cops, but no, she scares the shit out of them by just showing she's not as helpless as she seems, and for all these men, it's a very sobering experience. First of all, they now know she's conscious enough to report them to the cops. Secondly, they know they've been tricked, so what's she going to do to them next? They can't call the cops on her, what will they say? Hi, this woman I took home and intended to violate while she was out to it turned out to not be blacked out and threaten me? Yeah, that won't go over well, but she can't exactly go to the cops either because she is committing a form of entrapment here. But she can scare them shitless, give them that brief taste of what might be in store for them if they do this again, and she can hope it dissuades them. She's not trying to hurt anyone, she's basically attempting rehabilitation. 
She does point out to one gentleman that other women, unlike her, are more likely to resort to violence, to which he responds with, Why do you guys have to ruin everything? Ah <laughs> oh, yes, damn us women for ruining sexual assault for you, damn us to hell! What I love about this film is how it depicts the abusers. They're not gross, disgusting, offensive men or dangerous looking criminals or just any kind of man where if you got in your line of sight, you'd book it. No, they're charming, they're sweet, they come across as a knight in shining armor, get you to let your guard down and then take advantage of you. It's a very realistic depiction that many films don't show. We most often see the violent criminals, the dodgy guys in the alley, the stranger on the street. They're what these films tell us to look out for, but that's not necessarily reality. Yes, that happens, but in truth, most real rapes and assaults are committed by someone the victim knew, someone who they trusted, or someone who came to them appearing as a friend. Those are what we really need to watch out for, and yet we're not taught about that, and this applies to male victims as well. That certainly applied to me. I was 19 at a friend's birthday party. I got blackout drunk, my own fault. Could barely hold my head up. Most of that night is just small flashes of memories to me as I was so drunk I ended up with alcohol poisoning. Two of my friends gave me a lift home. One I'd known for six years, the other I'd known for close to 15 years. Grew up with him, he lived next door to my grandmother. I went to school with them. I trusted them to look after me. Instead, they stripped me and made me perform sexual acts on them while I was too intoxicated to even know where I was, what day it was, or what was happening. I was vaguely aware it's all just a blur to me. I didn't speak to them for a year after that, and I kept telling myself it was my fault. My own mother said it was my fault, and I deserved it was after a year my so-called friend of 15 years reached out and apologized. He didn't deny it, sugarcoat it, he knew he was a little under the influence but not enough to not know what he was doing was wrong and he hated himself for it and he gave me the acknowledgement and apology that I desperately needed. The other guy was confronted by a friend and said, and I quote, I have nothing to be fucking sorry for. Safe to say I never spoke to him again. At 20, I was nearly raped by my boss when he gave me a lift home from work. His only deterrent while taking my clothes off was that I was a virgin. Was not the last time he'd attack me either. Every girl and guy I have known who has been assaulted in some way had it happen at the hands of someone they knew or someone they didn't perceive as a threat. I'm not saying this is all the time. Many victims are at the hands of a violent perpetrator or serial rapist or worse, but more often that's not the case and it's a scenario that isn't depicted it enough and for that reason I greatly appreciate what this film did. This film shows us the occasional gross sexist guy but every single one of them is all bark and no bite. In one scene Cassie is receiving cat calls and various other gross comments from construction workers. She doesn't bite back or confront them. She simply stands there and stares them down, appearing unfazed and unbothered, and as quickly as they threw their comments, they ran for the hills because at the end of the day, people like that are cowards. In fact, all of the men in this film are cowards, which isn't unrealistic. Think of how many guys actually need a woman to be unconscious before they can make a move. This scene was the equivalent of how to respond to verbal bullying. Most, not all, but most of the time, a bully will keep using a word or phrase you find offensive because you have shown it affects you. But when you stop responding, when they can no longer use it to hurt you, they're often left floundering around looking like a gaping fish, and it's sad. Cassie eventually has the catalyst of her trauma come back into her life and so now it's time for revenge. She begins with her college friend who her friend Nina had turned to after she was raped and sought help from and was laughed at and turned away. She doesn't attack her or do anything violent but she sets up a scenario to make her experience what Nina did. She allows her to be scared wondering if at best she just cheated or at worst she was raped, making her walk a mile in Nina's shoes and it most certainly worked. 
Next, she turned on the dean of the university who did nothing to help Nina, feeling that her abuser's future was more deserving of protection. Cassie makes her think her daughter is at risk of meeting the same fate, but she's fine. However, it is sad that it took these extremes to make this woman admit she did the wrong thing and more than once, turning her back on victims and turning a blind eye in support of the promising futures their attackers may hold. Next, Cassie goes for the abuser's lawyer and she gets quite the surprise. Cassie's plans for psychological revenge are no longer needed when she sees the lawyer who defended Nina's abuser has had a complete psychotic break due to a guilty conscience brought on by Nina's suicide and the unorthodox practices of his firm. Riddled with guilt for how he mercilessly bullied and traumatized a rape victim into dropping her case, all for a bonus at the office, has now left him unable to live with himself. Cassie sees she doesn't have to do anything to him. He has seen the error of his ways, he knows what he did, and he acknowledges it and lives with it every day. Later in the film, Cassie mentions how it hurt her to realize how everyone had forgotten about Nina but her. So I feel this scene brought her some solace to know this man had in fact not forgotten about her at all. And so instead of revenge, she offers him a reprieve, her forgiveness. Again, showing her goal isn't to hurt anyone, it's to make them understand. After interacting with Nina's mother, she's convinced to let this go and move on with her life, and she does with a lovely, charming man who has given her a new outlook on life. But sadly, Cassie had already opened Pandora's box and so the past wasn't ready to stay buried. As soon as I saw Bo Burnham introduced, I knew his story wouldn't turn out well. I knew it was going to be revealed that he was involved somehow. It just seemed inevitable how this story would go, and it did. The torment Cassie inflicted on university friend Madison not only makes Madison atone for her sins, but share a video of the rape with Cassie, which, you guessed it, shows her boyfriend Ryan being present for the whole thing. This this was her psychotic break. I think at this moment Cassie kind of gave up on moving forward with her life and decided she was finally going to take this guy down and she didn't care what happened to her. She confronts her boyfriend Ryan who plays the victim like they all do and says the classic phrase used by so many I didn't even do anything. Words so many think absolve them of responsibility or consequence, forgetting the legal charge accessory was created for a reason. He stood there and watched a woman get raped repeatedly and did nothing, but he thinks he's innocent. Cassie finally sets out on her endgame to get justice for her best friend Nina by going after her rapist Al. To the wonderfully composed rendition of Britney Spears' Toxic, Cassie dresses as a stripper and waltzes into Al's bachelor party ready for revenge. Drugging the party guest, she takes him upstairs and cuffs him to a bed and begins not assaulting him, but merely trying to make him admit the truth and he won't do it. Even cuffed to a bed, he refuses to acknowledge it was rape, unable to even say the word. He cries and whimpers, pleading his innocence and portraying himself as a victim, which leads to this brilliant piece of dialogue. I was affected by it too, okay? I mean, it's every guy's worst nightmare getting accused like that. Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? This scene is great for several reasons. One, we see how pathetic this guy is. Two, we finally get to see Cassie open up about what she went through and what her friend went through. In this scene, we see how Cassie idolized her friend Nina. She was her world. She dedicated herself to taking care of her after she was attacked, and it wasn't enough because Nina couldn't live with what happened and ended her life. Aside from allowing us to know more about Cassie and a character we never met, it also shows us another aspect of sexual assault that again isn't talked about much, and that's the rip effect it has. Someone that broken and abused, their pain spreads and affects those around them, people like Cassie, and throughout the film we see the people it affected, but none more than Cassie. I'm not sure if Cassie ever truly intended to cause Al physical harm, as it doesn't seem part of her MO. Part of me believes she just intended to scare him into a confession. Another part of me thinks she had cracked so badly that she did fully intend to carve him up like a Christmas ham. My only issue with this scene was the cuffs. If she was using real kinky fluffy cuffs, then of course he broke free. In fact, he could have gotten both hands free easy. The chains are incredibly weak and there is a safety latch to open the cuffs designed for in case the keys go missing. But then again, she could have gotten real cuffs and just put fluffy protectors on them, but then again, if they were real, it shouldn't have broken so easily. Nevertheless, we have reached a moment I never saw coming, Cassie's death. 
Cassie miscalculated and Al smothers her to death. You never expect to see the protagonist, the focus of the film, meet this kind of end. And it was a brilliantly filmed scene. We see Al go from this legally defendable act of self-defense to full-blown murder. The scene takes quite a while, and it should. Suffocating someone takes longer than you'd think, so not only was it realistic, but it allows us to have that shift where you can at first forgive Al's actions, but when he chooses to keep going and make the choice to take a life, you're officially like, fuck this guy. Al and his best mate Joe, who filmed Nina's rape, like the awesome bro he is, helps his mate once again. This time he helps him to burn the body. This guy is like the devil on Al's shoulder, telling him he isn't the bad guy, helping him cover up crimes, never doing the violent stuff himself, but always talking a big game. Part of me is even convinced he gave Al the idea to rape Nina in the first place because of how pathetic and wimpy Al is. I have to again admit the fire scene was an issue for me. There was no way they burned her body successfully. If you watch enough crime documentaries as I do, then you've heard fire experts say that you need a specifically high temperature and insulation to cause a body to burn to ash, you know, like cremation, you know, that's why a crematorium has what it has. A bonfire in the woods exposed to the elements with no insulation or way to keep the fire burning or increasing in heat is going to burn out faster than it can burn the body, even with an accelerant, and most you're just going to get a charred corpse, but one easily identifiable as a human with DNA and teeth and all. So the fact this weak fire was able to burn Cassie to ash was something I was not buying. After this, you're watching in shock. Did we just watch our vigilante fail? Are we about to see this asshole get away with yet another crime? The film really makes you think you're going into the most fucked up ending ever. I even briefly thought Ryan was going to do the right thing and get revenge on Cassie's behalf given he'd figure out what had happened, but nope, piece chicken shit to the end. Instead, Cassie proves what a promising young woman she truly was and puts that intelligence she was so praised for to use. Prior to her death, she sets up contingency plans, which really implies that even if she succeeded, she didn't intend on staying on this earth for much longer. Cassie was smart enough to know that a woman in a cabin full of drunk men who has the potential to go horribly wrong, and she's prepared for that. She sends the video of the rape to the lawyer from earlier in the film, giving him a chance at redemption, with a detailed note saying where she intended to be and who to look to if she went missing. Just like that, the men who thought they got away with yet another crime finally get to see justice. Cassie made her final move and made sure she took them all down with her, including Ryan having sent him scheduled messages prior to her death, basically giving him and everyone else a fuck you from beyond the grave. This is an ending I could not and did not see coming, and it's so brilliant but painfully bittersweet. It took two innocent lives being snuffed out and so many other lives impacted because of not only a man that committed a crime, but those that let him do it and those who helped him get away with it. While justice in the end is served, it doesn't feel like enough. Two promising young women's futures were destroyed and in the end, as in reality, the punishment almost never fits the crime. Having said that, I couldn't have thought of a more poetic or badass ending if I tried. This was a sensational film, sensational performances, a brilliant story, a fun and clever soundtrack including Nothing's Gonna Hurt You Baby by Cigarettes After Sex, a song and band I fell in love with after I heard this song at the start of 2018's Our House. The ending was very emotional and creative. It has a really nice score to go along with it. The cinematography either has bubblegum pop kind of colour or is very cold and lifeless, which I think these both reflect the two extreme sides of Cassie's personality very well. I think maybe some scenes are a little dragged out and I don't think every scene transitions to the next as seamlessly as they could, but I didn't care all that much because I was just far too blown away by how incredible this film is. That's it for this review, and because it went on so long, I'm not doing a long-winded roundup. I will simply say comment below and share your thoughts on the film if you have seen it, or let me know if this is one you're interested in seeing, as I know it'll be available for streaming soon. Also be on the lookout for the companion video I mentioned at the start, where I take a deep dive into rape revenge films. If you want to see that, then hit subscribe and make sure to click the bell so you're alerted when I post that video. Thank you as always to my patrons. I'm sorry some asshole fucked over your content content recently, but I fixed it. I am off for now, so until next time, bye!